Good morning, everybody. So, there's a scripture that you've heard me share many, many times in this church. There is a road that seems right unto man, but the end thereof leads unto death. And this week, when I was praying about what I should be preaching on, the Lord spoke to me about this scripture. And I'm going to share with you a message today that I do believe is going to speak to all of you and get you to understand things in a completely different way. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25 says, <clears throat> There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Let's pause right there and let me ask you a question. How many of you are sometimes in a situation where you believe that you're 100% right and it's not negotiable, that's just the way it is? Just wave at me. Fine. I want you to listen to what the Word of God says. The Word of God says there is a way, a road, a way of doing things, a way of seeing things, a way of going through life that seems right unto man. But if you were to go and talk to God about it, He would say to you, but you're on a very bad path here. Because this is going to lead to death and destruction. There is a road that seems right unto man. We can put that in our family. Sometimes we treat family members a certain way and we are 100% con convinced that our way is the right way. But if you had to speak to God, he would say to you, ah, big problem here. This is wrong. Let's think of marriage. Sometimes we treat, we treat our husband a certain way. Sometimes we treat our wife a certain way because my father did it that way and his grandfather did it that way and popular culture says that that's the way that it should happen. Well, that might not be where God wants you to be. What you must understand is that your way is not necessarily the right way. And God warns us, before you choose a way, before you choose a path that you are going to go down, you better make sure that God says it is okay. Because if you don't, how many marriages fail? Well, gazillions. How many businesses fold? Plenty. How many people lose their jobs every day? Plenty. This scripture is one of the main reasons why these things happen. There is a road that seems right unto man, but the end thereof leads unto death. I want to tell you what's one of the biggest problems that mankind faces. Look at your neighbor and say stubbornness. I want to talk to you today about stubbornness. Sometimes we could be very, very stubborn. <clears throat> Sometimes God has been talking to you and talking to you and talking to you and talking to you through various different ways and various different means. But every time you hear what God says, it goes in this side, it goes out the other side, you do nothing about it. Sometimes you read something in the Bible and the Holy Spirit quickens your spirit and you have this feeling, listen, yeah, what I'm doing is not right. Probably I should be doing this or that. Or I'll just wait for the feeling to pass. And then I'll just carry on regardless. And then one day you're going to come to a place where you realize you've got nothing left. And then we get angry with God. Lord, why did you allow these things? Why did you let the devil take everything that I have? There's a road that seems right unto man, but the end thereof leads unto death. My brothers and sisters, listen to me carefully. You can't blame the devil. If you're the one that chose to be on a path that God is warning you, you should never have been on this path in the first place. Work. How many times... Do you come to a situation in a workplace where you realize after five years or 10 years that you've completely missed the plot? You have nothing to show for the last 10 years of your life and there you've lost your job or things have just gone completely haywire, but maybe you should have spoken to God about the decisions that you made when you chose to make it. I think we must all understand there is a very big difference between a good idea and a godly idea. They are not the same. Sometimes we get involved in a relationship that we know that we know that we know that this relationship is not good, but we become addicted to that person. And we're going to fight through this addiction to have what probably in our hearts God said to us, but this is not for you. And then five years, 10 years, 20 years down the line, everything falls apart. 
And once again, we get angry with God because why did he allow this? But here's the question. Was it from God to start off with? Or was this one of your so-called good ideas? We believe that our way is right because we feel that it is right or it seems right. I want to tell you something. There's a lot of jobs out there that offer you a lot of money. And if that is your criteria, you're going to obviously like, oh, I'm going to resign here and I'm going to go there because this is going to be a good idea. I'm going to make a fortune. But if you prayed about it and if you waited upon the Lord, because that's the other problem with mankind, we are very impatient. We wanted, we wanted yesterday. So we force ourselves into something. And now you get the job. And yes, the pay is very good, but you have to sell your soul to fit into that company. They demand more and more and more of your time. They start using and abusing you. You get phone calls all times of the day and night. You're wasting time, not spending it with your family. And when you do come home from work, you sit there until 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and you're working and working and working and working. You become cranky. You become irritable. This begins to be a problem between you and your wife. Your kids don't see you in the same way anymore. You never play with them. You see, there was a way that seemed right. The fact that there's a whole bunch of zeros on the back of your salary is like, this must be a good idea. See how God is blessing me. No, God's not blessing you. You know the story of Snow White. What did the red apple do? The red apple poisoned Snow White. How does the devil poison us? There's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof leads unto death. You must understand something about the devil. He's going to try and get you to go down many roads. But if you took the time to pray about it, if you took the time to study the word of God, if you spoke to God about it, you might start feeling very uncomfortable in your heart and in your spirit. God has protected me from many, many, many wrong decisions. Do you know how? Because I pray about it and then something inside of me changes. Sometimes I have this thing, just like all of you, I want this. And I begin to pray about it. And then in the process of praying about it, Something begins to happen. Sometimes I get this thing in my spirit that this tightness, almost like this anxiety begins to come. Do you know what's happening? The spirit of God is pushing on my heart. He says, what you want and what God wants are completely different. And if you go down this road, you're going to cry big tears tomorrow. And sometimes, you know what happens? And this has happened to me many times. I have this thing. I want this. I want this. And then I begin to pray about it. And tomorrow I wake up and I just don't want it anymore. It's gone from my system. Do you know who did that? God did that. Because here's the thing. God is my father. Listen to me. God loves you. God cares about you. God wants the best for you. You don't necessarily always want the best for yourself. The problem with the flesh of man, the flesh of man wants all the things that's wrong. The flesh of man wants all the things that probably somewhere along the line is going to give the devil some place and then you're going to cry later. And we need to learn to tune our ear and listen to God. History is full of examples how so many people's lives just prove that Solomon is absolutely right in everything that he said. God warns us that thinking that you are always right will inevitably lead to death. Do you hear what I'm saying? I'm sure we have a couple of people, yeah, that's your motto. I'm never wrong. I'm always right. You're already wrong in what you're saying because the word of God warns you. Don't get to that place. You know, one of the things that we need, we desperately need in life and in the church is we need to have a teachable spirit. The more we get to the end of the age, the less people are teachable. When you start teaching people the way, when you start teaching people the truth, when you start teaching people the life of Christ, they get angry with you. Because now you're infringing on their fun. They can't, what, I can't do this anymore. You know what, I don't know, I can never do nothing. You can push through and you can fight to get what you want. But Solomon will always be proved right. There is a road that seems right unto man. But the end thereof leads to the ways of death. Even though God's word has been proven right so many times, most people are just too in love with their own opinions that they really, really don't want to change. We all have very strong opinions on how life should be lived and how things should be done. 
please listen to me. I'm not here to step on your toes. I'm not here to upset you. I'm here to teach you the truth. Your way is not always the right way. And the more you fight to always have your way, the more you're going to suffer in life because there's a road that seems right unto man, but the end thereof leads unto death. <clears throat> your thoughts on matters come from your parents. They come from your teachers. They come from your friends. They come from religion, from habits, from culture, from Hollywood, from your experiences in life. Let me tell you something. If you, if you look at Hollywood and you plan your life according to what you see in the films, you're going to cry because it's fiction. That's not the way life is. And many times it's like that. Or we listen to somebody that's a friend of ours. They look like they're quite successful. And so therefore we give certain value to their opinion. But what we fail to take into account is that person does not serve God at all. And the Bible says you cannot serve both God and mammon. And if you now begin to listen to this person's advice, to the detriment of the word of God that dwells within you, you are going to cry. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Look at your neighbor and say, sometimes your imagination is very evil. Yeah, Rian, this is a tough one. Yes, it is, but it's necessary for us to hear these things. God wants you to know the truth. What pops into your mind tends to be more evil than good because your mind is part of the flesh. Your mind is part of sinful man. And how many times... Have you found yourself lying in bed at night, getting angry with somebody at work? Because, oh, they did this, and oh, they did that, and this one didn't greet me today. And blah, blah, blah. So by the time you get to work tomorrow, you're all angry with the person. Meanwhile, the oak has toothache. He was in his own little zone. It's not like he was dissing you or anything like that. He was just trying to cope with his own problems and his own issues. But by morning, you've made him public enemy number one. Where did it start? Your imagination. Now, listen to what the Word of God says. You don't have to take my word for it. Take the Word of God. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Look at Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been in a situation where you have something in your life that you convinced yourself, I've dealt with it, I'm over it. It's no longer an issue in my life. Praise God, glory, hallelujah, I have overcome. I am more than a conqueror through Christ. And then one day, suddenly out of the blue, without even trying, it pops out again and it's worse than it ever been. When we look at our hearts, D-boy, when you look at your heart, you tend to convince yourself, mm, I'm actually not so bad. There's a difference between what we see and what God sees. Look at what it says in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I put it to you today that the Word of God tells you that you don't know your own heart. But in certain conditions and in certain circumstances, your heart will pop out what you've been hiding. So, if the heart is deceitfully wicked, and the Bible says we don't necessarily know what is exactly in our hearts, then why do we so often say to people, I'm going to follow my heart? You should check whether what's in your heart is what God wants. Because there's a road that seems right unto man, but the end thereof leads unto death. And God's word warns us that our hearts tend to be wicked. And sometimes we don't want to see that. So taking into account what the word of God has to say about your heart and what the word of God has to say about your imagination. Do you still think 
after listening to what you heard today, that when you, sorry, um, that if you solely rely on what's in your heart and in your mind, that it will be a recipe for success. The world is full of people that did that. They convinced themselves in their mind and in their thoughts, and they followed their heart, not realizing that sometimes it can be wicked. And then somewhere along the line, somebody's tried to pick up the pieces because everything just fell apart. It is also wise to note that when you rely on your own opinions, the Bible warns us that it will lead to the way of death. Solomon wrote many Proverbs that all touch on the same theme. This is a common theme throughout the Proverbs. Proverbs 28 verse 26 says, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Oh, I'm not going back to that church. The pastor called me a fool. No, it's not me. It's the word of God. Listen to what the word of God says. How do you know when you are a fool? He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whosoever walks wisely shall be delivered. How do I walk wisely when I know the word of God? When I pray to God, when I trust in the Lord, and when I allow the wisdom from the word of God to lead and guide me, and I don't follow, follow after my foolish heart. Proverbs 21 verse 2 says, Every man, sorry, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord ponders the man's heart. This is important. Listen to it. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. That's where sometimes we battle. Because somebody will come to you and say, listen, yeah, that might not be a good idea. What do you know? I want to ask you a question. What if God sent that person to give you a different perspective? What if God sent that person to talk to you to open your eyes? But because of your stubbornness, because of your arrogance, and because of the fact that you always ride, you just that and like, I'll do it my way. What did Frankie say? I've done it my way. Can I show you where the people are that do it their way? They're somewhere there, totally off the path. And they realize to their own shame and to their own stress, that they are not on the path that God wanted for them. Proverbs 12 verse 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that listens to counsel is wise. Please record. Up here. And listen to this wisdom coming from a man of God that was wise beyond all means. Proverbs 12, verse 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that listens to counsel is wise. In other words, when somebody comes to talk to you about something, don't just immediately dismiss them and like, ah, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. How many of you believe that God is your father? So I have three children. And what, go, what happens in their lives actually matter to me. It matters a lot. That's why I don't keep quiet when they make nonsense. I, I, I've got a voice and I'm going to tell them, I don't like what you're doing here. What you're doing here is wrong. You shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be doing that. And I think sometimes they get a bit irritated with me and sometimes they feel a bit offended. But if I truly love them, then when I see something that's wrong and I realize that one day they're going to pay a dear, a dear price for that, should I keep quiet or should I say something about it? Here's the problem with people today. We take offense so quickly. How dare you talk to me about my life? How dare you tell me that I am wrong? Go read your Bible. God is very big on saying no. God is very big on warning people what will happen if you do this and that and that and that. And God's word is proven true. Because the Israelites spent 40 years cruising around the same mountain because their attitude was wrong. Because when God told them this is right, they were like, oh, but you don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to do it my way. And none of them entered into the promise of God. Do you know how you enter into the promise of God? When you begin to listen to God. When you begin to take God seriously. When the word of God says, don't do this, even though all your friends are doing the same thing, you're going to turn around and say, you know what? God and his opinion matters more than the circle that I'm in. And yes, if I'm going to say goodbye to a couple of friends today, then so be it, because I care what God thinks of me. I care what God says. 
It's not what some say. It's what he says that ultimately matters. A wise man learns not to trust his own thinking and to seek the will of God on every matter. My dear brothers and sisters, I want to say something to you that I want you to please remember in the future. Everybody has to make decisions. And some decisions are, you know, you don't have to ask for wise counsel when you decide what color underwear to wear. You know, it's up to you. God doesn't care. But when you decide to change work, or when you decide that you want to hmm, buy a new house that you know is very, very expensive, and you have a feeling that you could have problems, and wise counsel comes to you and says to you, but listen, yeah, have you done all the sums? You can't really afford this. Ah, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to do it my way. Six months later, the bank repossesses the house. There's your problem. Because we don't like to listen. He that listens to counsel is wise. The wise man avoids the world's seductive ways that the Bible warns us will lead unto death. And a wise man realizes that he is in fact ignorant when compared to the wisdom of God. Now, I'm not saying that, there, that none of you here know anything. You know a lot. You've You've got a lot of wisdom in yourself. You've got a lot of experience. And yes, you can help others. But how do you measure the wisdom that you have? How do you measure the experience that you have with what God has? The fact is you can't. Because God sees everything. And here's a wonderful truth. God knows the future. None of you do. And sometimes, even though what you see today... You can't refute it. Everything looks fine. Everything looks right. If you had to pray to God, let's talk about housing. Imagine if you go and buy a three or four or five million rand house today. And you spoke to a couple of people and they all warned you that, you know what? This is very close to the limit. And if anything happens, if the interest rate goes up 1%, you're going to have problems. Ah, God will make a way. God is my provider. It sounds good, doesn't it? But you're using scripture to manipulate the situation to get what you want. That's witchcraft. Nothing else. And so God sends one, God sends two, God sends three people to you to talk to you. And eventually God says, I'm not sending nobody else. You want it? Have it. Two years later, the property market crashes. Interest rates are through the roof. Number one, you can't afford to pay your mortgage on the house anymore. And number two, even if you try to sell it, you bought it for three million. It's worth 850,000 now. You're going to cry. But the thing is, if you prayed and you spoke to God about it because he knows the future, probably your heart would become very troubled and you would have no peace. And you would sit down with your wife and you would say, Lovey, I know you love that house, but I want to tell you something. I've been praying and God's been talking to me. I have, this, I have this aversion. Something in me is not right. Something is scratching me. We can't go down this road. Ah, but my husband, we... No, God spoke to me. This is not a good way for us to go. The wise man prays to God to search his heart and his thoughts. And the wise man judges every opinion by clear biblical doctrine. Do you hear that? Everybody in this world has an opinion. But that doesn't mean that their opinions are godly. Sometimes it's just their opinion. Look, look at what Proverbs 30 verse 2 to 3 says. Surely I am only a brute, not a man. I do not have human understanding. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I attained to the knowledge of the Holy One of God. What he's doing is he's comparing his knowledge with what God has. And he says, compared to God, I am an imbecile. Compared to God, I know nothing. Therefore, I need to hear what God has to say. It's not just what I want. It's what God has to say. Proverbs, so, sorry, Psalm 139, 23 to 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. And know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. 
the writer of the song prays to God and he says, Lord, I have a lot of plans. I have a lot of purposes. I have a lot of schemes. I want to do all these things, but I'm going to step back and I'm asking you to come and search me. And if anything in me is not pleasing unto you, or if I'm being deceived by the world or by the devil, I'm going to choose to take a step back. See if there is any offensive way. In other words, if the way that I want to go is going to be offensive to you and is going to lead me down the path of destruction and lead me in the way of everlasting. How do you get to walk the way of the everlasting? By listening to God. By actually beginning to take God serious in life. By realize that these things are not games that we play. This is the real deal. This is where the techie meets the door. And if we do things wrong, we are going to suffer. Do not look at popular thinking to find reassurance on your own opinions. There's a truth for you. I want to do something. My mom said no, my dad says no, but all my friends have done it. I'm going to do it. Yeah. You're going to learn that your mom and dad were right. Because if you base your decisions on popular culture and popular thinking, how many of you have realized that Christianity is not very popular right now? God is not popular at all. In fact, if you want an argument at work, you must start talking about God. If you want people to be instantly offended, you must start talking about God. So these people that get so offended so quickly, and these people that hate it when you talk to them about God, where is their wisdom coming from? Well, it can't be God, then where is it coming from? Well, if it's not coming from the light, it must be coming from the darkness. Who's the prince of darkness? Satan is the prince of darkness. The majority of mankind is in love with themselves and they are in love with each other. But God considers their thoughts to be an abomination. Jeez, Leon, where did you find all this stuff? It's in the Bible. And if we take the time to read the word of God, these things begin to jump out at us and we begin to see life in a different way. Listen to Luke 16 verse 15. Jesus said to them, you are the ones who justify yourself in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable unto God. Did you hear that? There are a lot of things that the world is fighting for today that if you took the time to speak to God about it, he would say to you, you better not go there because this is detestable to me. The problem is when you speak to people around you, they're all going to convince you, oh, what's the worst that can happen? It's not that bad. No, man, we're just having a bit of fun. How many people listen to that voice of Satan speaking to somebody else and today they're gone? How many people have committed suicide because they listen to other people? You can talk to people. I'm, I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm sketching a scenario. Money. When you go talk to certain people, they get, oh, come and invest here by me. Come and do this. Come and do that. And here's the thing. When you talk to people about money yesterday, I tell you what, they got the gift of the gab, eh? They can literally sell ice to an Eskimo. And they're going to convince you that by the end of next year, you're going to be a multimillionaire. And then you're not 100% sure, but, well, my Tommy Pete went for it, and Mr. Wilson went for it, and D-Boy has gone for it. Well, these people are also not stupid. I mean, probably it's a good idea. Boom. Take all your money invested there. Three months later, it turns out it was a Ponzi scheme. It's a pyramid scheme. Every cent that you put in there is gone. Listen to what Jesus had to say. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable to God. When you talk to people, they're going to come with things. I see it this way. I see it that way. Take a step back and ask God, Lord, but what do you say? And you might realize that what these people are doing is detestable unto God. Jesus clearly warns us that most men take the wide gate and the bread. Sorry. Sorry. Jesus clearly warns us 
I'm battling to read my own uh, handwriting, yeah. I was writing very quick. <laughs> Jesus clearly warns us that most men take the wide gate and the broad way to destruction. Only a few take the straight gate and the narrow way to life. Did you hear that? If this makes sense to you, you must immediately begin to think about the people that you allow to speak into your life. Because he has a warning, Matthew 7, verse 13 to 14, enter through the narrow gate. <clears throat> For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. When it looks too good to be true, it most definitely is. Because that's what everybody wants. They want a life of joy. They want to believe the lies of the devil. They want to have a lot of fun. Even enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate. And narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few will find it. One day when we get to heaven, I want to tell you something. We're in for a surprise. Because people think that heaven is totally overpopulated. When you read the scriptures, you're going to realize hell is overpopulated. Heaven is quite empty. Because most of mankind doesn't care about the narrow road. Let me show you something about the narrow road. Let's say, for argument's sake, that the narrow road is a thin line that is running here. In order for me to walk on the narrow road, I have to concentrate. I have to focus. I have to be diligent. I have to work hard. I can't take chances. Let me show you what the Broadway is about. You can go wherever you want. You can go anywhere. But the problem is the Bible warns us that the Broadway leads to eternal damnation, leads to destruction. People don't want to hear that God says no to a lot of things. But I want to tell you something. God is a father and fathers have to learn to say no. If you're sitting here today and you are a father, if you're sitting here today and you are a mother, the word no should come out of your mouth a lot more than the word yes. Because most of the things your kids want to get involved with are not good for them. And God put you there to lead them, to teach them, to guide them. When you chore me, chore me with your kids, they are on the broad road that leads to destruction. Your kids need a father, they need a mother that loves them, that cares for them, and that's not afraid to say no. Because many times you ask God for things and he says, no. Why does God say no? To upset you? No. He says no to protect you. If you've ever given your heart to God, understand that your heart is precious to him. And he actually cares what happens to that heart. He wants that heart, he wants your soul, he wants your life to be with him for everlasting. But he also realizes that there are two things that demand your attention. The broad way and the wide gate is always calling people to come. Listen, yeah, the devil's PR department is phenomenal. He sells hell very, very actively. And so many people, yes, today I want that kind of a life. But he never tells you that you've got to sell your soul to have that kind of a life. To make a decision to take the narrow road might not make you that many friends. But then again, let me tell you something about friendships. You don't need, a, you don't need 500 friends. Oh, but Rion, you don't understand. I have a thousand friends on Facebook. No, you don't. You have a thousand people nosy about your life. They can't wait to go and talk rubbish behind your back for everything that you post. That's not called friendship. In fact, that's a trap. The true friends are the ones that's there with you through thick and thin. The ones that are willing to say to you when you're wrong and say to you, listen, D-boy, my friend, I love you very much, but I want to tell you something. You can't talk to your wife like that. And we all know that you talk to your wife nicely. Eh? Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but they say if the shoe fits. 
But we need people in our life that are willing to tell us the truth. And the only people that are going to tell you the truth are the people that walk the narrow road because they listen to God. And they care enough about you to try to make sure that you stay on the road. Amen. King Saul, who was the king of Israel, the first king of Israel, had an idea. And let me tell you something. The more he thought about it, the more he convinced himself that I have a very good idea. He was warned not, he was warned to, 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 to kill all the animals after they had had a, uh, a battle and he had been victorious. And he was warned that the king must be executed. But then when he sat there, and I almost want to tell you that his friends were around him. And probably this is what happened. I'm sketching you a, a scenario. Some of his advisors said to him, but listen, yeah. I, I know God said we must kill all these animals, but surely that would be a big waste. Are you sure that you heard right? Did you hear Samuel correctly? What if we keep these animals and later on we do a big sacrifice unto God and the king, why must we kill him? He's got contacts. He knows a lot of people. He can get us in Yeah, he can get us in there. And you know what? The more he listened to that instead of listening to God, the more he began to convince himself, ooh, this is actually a very good idea. And you know what he did? He chose the road that seems right unto man. And he realized to his great shock and horror that it led to death. Instead of slaughtering all the good animals of the Amalekites, he would keep them for the people to offer to God. But God had already clearly stated that they must be slaughtered. And so Samuel the prophet condemned Saul's thinking. And do you know what he said to him? What you did is nothing other than witchcraft and idolatry. Wait, just rewind a bit. <laughs> Some things that pop into your mind, especially when they are contrary to God, God sees that as witchcraft. Acts chapter 26 verse 9. Sorry, 1 Samuel 15 verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Sometimes we know what the right thing is to do. But then a thought pops into your mind. Well, if I do this, nobody's really going to know. My parents won't know. My wife won't know. My kids won't know. I'm not going to tell nobody nothing. I'm just going to do it because this looks like a very good idea. Do not be surprised if one day the prophet Samuel comes knocking on your door and he says to you, what have you done? Your rebellion towards the word of God has brought witchcraft upon you. What is witchcraft? Witchcraft is control. Anybody that allows witchcraft in their life gets controlled by Satan very quickly, boom, very easily. And now there is it. Because witchcraft has come upon your life, the devil is now pulling the strings and he's controlling you to the pit. Acts chapter 26 verse 9. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Who wants to venture an opinion? Who's talking here? The Apostle Paul. Listen to this. He says, I verily thought, he says, I truly thought to myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, too, thought to himself, that it was a good idea to do the opposite of what God wanted him to do. Saul's mistake was following after the foolishness in his heart instead of checking with God first. And I want to tell you something. People played a role in what he did because he used to hang around with Pharisees. And many of the Pharisees would say to him, yesterday we need more people like you. 
Yes, we must eradicate this new religion. This is not good. Yet, he knew the scriptures. And he knew from the scriptures that Jesus Christ is not a myth. The promise of the Messiah was clear. And Jesus ticked all the right buttons. And in his heart, he knew. But can I tell you something about Paul at that stage in his life? I think he wanted the praise of men more than the praise of God. That's why he says here, he actually says, I can't believe that I allowed my thoughts to be in a place that they contradicted the word of God. And we all know what happened to him because of that, right? He, he became blind. And it was God's way of showing him that even though he convinced himself so many times, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, I see clearly now that he actually saw nothing because he's blind. You need an outside opinion that is perfectly right to measure your own thinking against. So where do we find that? Where do we find that perfect opinion? The Word of God. When you begin to know the Word of God and you apply the Word of God to your decisions and you measure what people tell you based on the Word of God, you're going to start making a lot better decisions. You will not frequent the pit so often. You will not be lost. How many times have you said, I, I just, I feel so lost. Do you know when we feel lost? When it's not the word of God directing us, but the opinions of man, including our own. Psalm 119 verse 128 says the following. And because I consider all of your precepts right, I hate every wrong path. This is where your life should be. Listen to what he says. I believe it was... David that wrote this, and because I consider your precepts right, I hate every wrong path. David would not negotiate with somebody that came to him and tried to lead him astray with their thinking, their reasoning, or their plans. He told them straight, that's not from God. I'm not going there. Sometimes we wonder, why did God look at David and say he was a man after God's own heart? Because say kop was reg op geskroef. His head was screwed on right. And he understood that there's a difference between what God wants and what man wants. And he was careful to obey God rather than to obey man. Isaiah 8 verse 20 says, consult God. Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to his word, they have no light of dawn. He says, yeah, you should always go back to the word of God and whatever somebody came to share with you, whatever somebody came to tell you, whatever somebody's trying to get you involved with, if it is not in line with the word of God, the light of God cannot be in them. They're going to lead you to darkness. They cannot take you to light. And brothers and sisters, this happens every day. Good Christian people get taken for a ride every single day. Do you know why? Because they lack wisdom. Do you know why? Because they don't apply the word of God to the decisions that they make. And they don't measure what people tell them based on the truth in the word of God. Sometimes it's as simple as greed. You know, greed is one of the seven deadly sins, right? How many people's lives are destroyed today because we were greedy? Because somebody said, if you invest X amount, I'm going to give you so much. And even though there were red lights everywhere, the devil saw the greed in your heart and he just kept pushing you and pushing you. And then one day you put everything there. And then tomorrow you have nothing. The Bible is a wonderful gift from God to his children. It contains the very true essence of who God is and it contains wisdom that comes directly from the mouth of God. 2 Timothy 16 verse 17 says, All scripture, please repeat after me, All scripture is God breathed and is useful. Please repeat after me, The word of God is useful. 
I want you to look deep into his eyes and say the word of God is useful. Huh? The word of God is useful. Um, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and for training us up in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. How do you come to a place that you are thoroughly equipped and your life becomes successful? When you're very selective who you listen to. When you stop listening to the mockers. When you stop listening to the liars. When you stop listening to the deceivers. When you stop listening to the world. And you realize, it's time for me to listen to God. Because he's the only one that knows what he's talking about. So the Bible should always be your first standard for wise and correct thinking. The next step would be to consult wise and successful men who also use God's word as their standard. Look at this, Proverbs 11 verse 14. For lack of guidance, a nation falls. In other words, if you are the leader of a nation, but you don't accept guidance from the people around you, you're dooming your nation to destruction. Because nobody knows everything. And God can sometimes, you know, the Bible makes it clear that God spoke to a man through a donkey. Another word for a donkey is an ass. God can give you revelation through an ass, not somebody's ass, an ass. You understand? God can speak to us when we allow our ears to be tuned to him. Proverbs 15 verse 22 says, Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. If you have to make life-altering decisions, you should always have a couple of people around you that you bounce things off of, that you talk to about things. Because can I tell you what happens to us? And I'm, I'm the same. Let's say we, we want to buy a new car or we want to buy a new cell phone, we, you know, we can get all hyper about these things. Johnny, am I lying? You know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Hey, you chose such a good day to come to church. In fact, I'm so proud of you. Amen. We get so excited about things that like, we just want to go and do it. But probably what we should do before we just go there and put ourselves in the dwang, we should talk to one or two people because here's the thing. You become so emotionally worked up about what you want that you just don't care. But if you speak to one or two people that have wisdom, who God speaks to, they might tap you on the shoulder and say, listen, yeah, did you consider this? Did you consider this? Have you thought about that? What if this happens? And yes, that's not what you wanted to hear. But when you listen to wise counsel, your plans fall into place. So today you say no to this. Tomorrow God blesses you with something even better. Because you were wise. We must strive <clears throat> to be humble enough to ask for and to be receptive to good and godly advice. Many times in my life, I have experienced the complete opposite. I want to be honest with you. Sometimes I don't like counseling. Not because I think it doesn't work. I know that it works. Because most of the people that you spend all that time and all those hours counseling never listen to what you say. They go to you and they're like, uh, I want to do this and this and this. What do you think? Oh, it's a very bad idea. The Bible says this and this and this. It's not what they wanted to hear. They run away from you to another guy who tells them exactly what they want to hear. And then six months later, they stand before you and like, oh, please pray for me. Everything in my life is falling apart. I can't understand how I got to this place. No, you do. Because you don't listen when God talks to you. Because you don't like wise counsel. You like what you want. Yesterday. Today's hectic. But I want to tell you something. God is talking to all of you today. Because you all have to hear this. And I listen, I'm, me, I'm listening. My ears are like... Dit, 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 dit. Because this is the mistakes that we make. If you're sitting here today and you're stubborn, you better drop it. Because your stubbornness is going to lead you nowhere except down to the pit. If you're sitting here today and you're self-righteous and you think you never make mistakes, you better drop it. 
because you're going to end up in the pit. Everybody makes mistakes. There's not one perfect person here. In fact, we make a lot of mistakes all the time. But the way to start fixing those mistakes is to start looking at the Word of God differently. Is to start acting upon the Word of God and not make like we don't need this stuff. Of course you do. Remember that pride, this thing of I can do it all myself, has been the downfall of many people and will continue to be the downfall of those who embrace it. 1 Peter 5, verse 5 to 6. <clears throat> In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. I want to talk to the young people here today. Sometimes you get irritated because your mom says something to you. Sometimes you get irritated because your father doesn't agree with your plans. And you have this thing, don't they realize that I'm an adult? Well, you've probably been an adult for a year or two. What have you learned? Nothing. No, seriously, you've learned bugger all. But your parents have been down that road. They've made a lot of mistakes. A lot of wisdom has entered their lives. And probably they know the word of God a lot better than you. And when they talk to you about stuff, it's not to give you a hiding. It's not to, to undermine you. It's not to be ugly to you. It's because they've probably made the same mistake that you are about to make. And they just want your life to be better. Oh, but we can get so quickly offended when we are told what to do. Listen, yeah. The word of God is profitable for instruction. The word of God needs to tell you what to do. Because on your own, you don't know what to do. Without the word of God, the Bible says, for the word of God is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Please close your eyes, all of you. What do you see? Nothing. So <clears throat> when you insist on living your life outside of the word of God, you don't see where you're going. And you're going to make every same mistake that everybody else out there made. But when you allow, sorry, you could open your eyes again. I'm just trying to show you that when your eyes are closed, <clears throat> when your eyes are closed, the simplest task becomes very, very difficult. Do you know how we find our way in life? When the word of God is your spotlight and when you allow the word of God to illuminate your path, when you stop being anti the word of God, when you stop getting offended because the word of God tells you no, or you speak to somebody that, that loves God and that has wisdom and they show you the reasons why this is not a good idea. When you become teachable, then your life begins to go forward. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you must clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. When God talks to you and you're too proud to listen, God begins to oppose you. Instead of being your helper, he becomes your adversary. Oh, but Rihanna, I thought that's the devil's job. God says in his word, when he sees pride in your heart, he won't work with you, he'll begin to work against you. Do you realize why sometimes your life goes nowhere? Because when God's hand is out and he says, stop, you're not going to push it out of the way. Then he wants you to learn something and he wants you to change. <laughs> One of Satan's original sins that led to his total corruption was simply the sin of pride. I know everything. Nobody can tell me nothing. I don't have to listen to none of you. He didn't need God anymore. He decided that he could do it all by himself. And can I tell you something? He still works in exactly the same way in the lives of people. How many times has somebody said, I, I, don't, need, I don't need you to tell me what to do? Be very careful. Because Satan today is called Satan and not Lucifer because of this attitude. And Satan today is no longer found in the heavens. He crawls around on the floor yeah, on the earth because of this attitude. And if God punished him for that attitude, what makes you think that God will not do the same to me or you? He still works in the same way by influencing mankind with this thinking. What is that thinking? You don't need nobody. You can do it all yourself. 
They're just trying to interfere with you. They just want to control you. Yes, there's people out there that want to control you. But when you have wisdom in your heart, you'll begin to see that. And some of the people that the devil convinces you wants to control you actually want the best for you. The devil just doesn't want you to see that. Proverbs 9 verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What is the beginning of wisdom? It's not how many scriptures you could quote. The Pharisees back in the day could quote the Bible verbatim. They could stand in front of the people and they could preach huge sermons and they impressed everybody with their so-called wisdom, but there was no wisdom there because they did not fear God. And there's a lot of preachers today that are preaching from the pulpit, but they do not fear God. If they feared God, they would tell the truth. But they like to pat people on the shoulder and they like to say to them, it's not that bad. The grace of God is sufficient for you. Don't worry, don't worry. Alles is okay. But it's not. Because you know what? Wisdom begins when we fear God. You know, when the word of God speaks to me, the word of God says to me, I better not be fearing Vera. I better be fearing God. And I don't have a problem with you. I'm just using you as an example. And I better not be fearing Cosy. I must be fearing God. And, and I better not be fearing little Johnny. I, I must be fearing God. And sometimes I might need to talk to somebody about something. And I might know in my heart that they're not going to like what I have to say. But I better say it anyway. Because if I fear man above God, then I will end up in the pit myself. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through wisdom, your days will be many and yours will be added to your life. Do you want to have a successful life? That's what the Bible says here. Start fearing God. Stop fearing the people around you. Stop being afraid of everybody and let God be the one that speaks to you. Let God be the one that guides your decision making. Wisdom begins by fearing God, by acknowledging that God is real. By realizing that you really do need God. Any man who claims not to need God has simply already been controlled and deceived by Satan. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 15. You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. I'm going to repeat that. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips. In other words, you know how to say everything. You know how to sound so religious. You can impress just about anybody, but you cannot impress God if you are not truthful. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. This is a classic religious spirit. It likes to tell everybody, I know the Bible. The Bible says this, the Bible says that, but when you look at their life, they don't do what they say. The word of God says, you hypocrite. They worship me in vain. Did you hear that? When I read this, this, this week, it actually touched my heart. Our churches are full of people that are worshiping God in vain. Their worship will never touch the heart of God. Because the attitude is wrong. Don't think just because you stand there with your arms up and you glory, hallelujah, and praise God that you're touching the heart of God. If your life is not right, if your heart is not right, you're not touching nothing. You're just singing. And there's a big difference between worshiping God and touching the heart of God and just singing. Respectfully, you might as well be listening to Michael Jackson. Because it has the same effect. It does nothing for God. When you follow human rules, human wisdom, then God calls you a hypocrite when you attempt to worship Him. How many people worship God in vain in churches every Sunday? Their wisdom, their thoughts, their plans on based, are not based on God's Word. In fact, Although they sit in church, they don't know, neither do they obey, neither do they follow the word of God. 
if you want to begin to avoid the ways of death, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in your personal life, whether it's in your business, in your work situation, whatever, you need to first come to the realization that you cannot get there all by myself. In fact, the main reason why many people end up in the ways of death is simply because they try to do it all by themselves. They insist on doing it their way. You need to come to a place that you will accept nothing but what is clearly laid out in the word of God. Where are the men who will only accept the old paths of faith that once used to be delivered to the saints? Jeremiah 6 verse 16 says, This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and then walk in it and you will find rest for your soul. Did you hear that? This is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads. In other words, when you come to a crossroad, it's not just like, mm, I feel like going there. Stand at the crossroad. When you've come to a place that you have to make decisions in your life, stand at the crossroad. Ask for the ancient paths. What is the ancient paths? Ancient words. It's the word of God. Ask, what does the word of God say to me? How is God talking to me today? Ask where the good way is. And then when God says you must go right, even though everything in you wants to go left, listen to him. Because he knows why he told you not to go left and to go right. Walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. I fully understand that today's message was hectic. This was pop and flesh. This was not milk. But you needed it. If you want to become a mature child of God, you need to learn to chew on the word of God. You need to hear the truth. You know, the Bible says that in the last days, people will gather around themselves. Pastors, preachers, teachers. Who will preach what their itchy ears want to hear. It's very easy. To impress people. I just have to preach a nice feel-good message, yeah? Something that's a bit on the line of positive thinking or, you know, a very motivational thing that makes you feel good about everything about yourself. And I must just tell you that God loves you and everything's going to be okay. And you're going to be like, yeah, this pastor preached such a lack of message today. And then when I'm alone, the hand of God's going to grab my heart and begin to squeeze me and say to me, what the heck are you doing? These people need to hear the truth. I didn't put you there to justify their sinful life. I put you there to preach about it. I didn't put you there to put more darkness in their life. I put you there to bring light. Because in the light, things change. In the light, we see things differently. Today, the world is full of very small churches. And you know why they're small? Because the pastor that stands behind the pulpit cares enough about the people to preach the truth. And the truth can be offensive, but it's also the only thing that can set you free. The lie keeps you in bondage. Have you noticed what's happening in the States? Have you seen how many of the big, big, big mega churches are all falling one after the other, after the other? Do you know why? Because they weren't preaching the word of God. They were preaching what the itchy ears of men want to hear. And God cannot bless that. But God will bless you if you listen. And if you allow the word of God to fill your heart. And if you are willing to change when you realize that you need to change. Did anybody learn something today? Please give the Lord a beginning. Blessed Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you that the Word of God speaks to us. Thank you that you care enough for your children, that you give us guidance, that you give us direction, that you sometimes contradict the way we're going, and that you many, many times say no. This happens because you actually do care where we end up. 
Forgive us, Lord, that so many times when you say no to us, we take offense and we get upset. How many people today don't go to church because somebody told them in love what they had to hear and now they're upset and they're offended? The purpose of the Word of God is to inspire us, to sometimes rebuke us, to instruct us on the way that we should go. As a father, I want the best for my children. As my father, you want the best for me. Forgive us, Lord, that sometimes we get upset, that sometimes we are stubborn and we refuse to listen when you've sent one, two, three, four, ten people to speak to us. We have this stubbornness in us that says, I will not bend because I know that I'm right. In the end, the only one who truly knows anything is God. Lord, help us to humble ourselves before you. Help us to let go of the spirit of pride that many times we allow to get into our hearts because that's just giving the devil a lot of place that he will use against you to bring destruction. Forgive us, Lord, that we are sometimes disobedient simply because we want to please the flesh, even though we know it's wrong. Thank you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit is and always will be indeed our helper. And I pray today, Holy Spirit, that as the word of God went out, that you will whisper in their ears and show them where the word today is applicable to their lives. And then may they have the humility to lay down the pride, to lay down the self-righteousness, and say, sorry, Lord, I'm wrong. I want to change. I thank you that you care for us. I thank you that I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and to give you a future. I thank you, Lord, that this reveals to us the heart of God for his children. Sometimes we just want to hear yes, 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 yes of everything we bring before you. And we don't realize that when God says no, 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 it's to protect us. May the spirit of wisdom speak to all of us through the word today and through the word in days to come. May the Holy Spirit quicken the word of God that lives in our souls. And may the word of God rise up when people come into our lives that want to lead us astray that want to corrupt our way of life, our thinking. Thank you that you care for us, Lord. Bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen.